Let's get it. This is Life's Essential Ingredients with Jeff and a mic, where we hope to inform, inspire, and transform lives one essential ingredient at a time. Welcome to the show. Uh, listeners, thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Life's Essential Ingredients. Still can't believe it. Got to pinch myself all the time. We're season three, episode seven. Legendary coach Frank Alaco coming from the San Francisco Bay Area today. And the first place where you can find coach is just through his website. And it's frankalaco.com. And his last name, A-L-L-O-C-C-O, and then .com. So about our guest, Coach Alaco was born and raised in New Providence, New Jersey. While in high school, Coach Alaco lettered in three sports and always had the dream of playing football at Notre Dame. Coach achieved his dream and played on the 1973 National Championship champion team. Coach was a great athlete and also lettered in basketball and played for the legendary Irish coach, Mike's buddy, Digger Phelps. Coach graduated with his degree in sociology and in 1976 wised up and moved to beautiful and sunny California. Sorry, coach had to throw that little zinger at you. In 1981, coach founded Excel in basketball. Coach has done just that, Excel, and has helped thousands of young players do the same on and off the court. Coach won a state championship at Northgate High School in 1995 and won two more as head coach at De La Salle High School. Only coach in California state history to win a state championship at two different schools. In 2012, coach was inducted into the Sports Faith Hall of Fame. Coach Alaco is a national and international motivational speaker and clinician and currently works at the University of San Francisco as the executive senior associate athletic director. Coach, thanks for dedicating your life to the game of basketball and more importantly, to the thousands of student athletes you have helped along the way. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Coach. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I, I appreciate all the work that you and your foundation are doing to, to help help kids and, and help adults, really help us all and, and keep us pointing in the right direction uh, as we really live the core values that are so essential to success. I love it. It's going to be a great episode. Uh, whether you're a, a athlete, a coach, or just somebody interested in uh, living life the right way, Coach is going to guide us uh, with his amazing career. And Coach, we always start the episode with a thought of the day. And uh, this is season three, uh, episode seven. And so we're probably at about 100 episodes and we're 100% of picking these. So you could be honest with me of Jeff. Hey, you're totally wrong with this one. I don't get why you would pick it for me. Um, but uh, here it is. And it's from Robert and Ree. And here it goes. The object of painting a picture is not to make a picture. However unreasonable this may sound. The picture, if a picture results, is a byproduct and may be useful, valuable, interesting as a sign of what has passed. The object, which is the back of every true work of art, is the attainment of a state of being, a high state of functioning, a more than ordinary moment of existence. Why would I pick that one for you? That's a fantastic quote. And it is, it is funny because, you know, I do a lot of work with coaches and and and, and leaders. I'm still on the presently established CYO League over here. I've been involved with CYO since I was 22 years old, right? I've been on the board uh, for CYO. And so I so I do t- talk to a lot of youth leaders and coaches. And, and it's just funny. Yesterday, I was talking to my son. You know, my son is an outstanding coach at Clayton Valley High School. Um, and, and we were just talking about, you know, the changes in kids. And, and what a gift it is to to be able to mentor, mentor, mentor children and, and to provide them with leadership and, and and not only teach them, but to be role models for them. And and we we're talking about that. It's really not about success. Right. And that's what that quote is about. It's it's really not about that final product, that final that final painting. It's really about helping people to develop their full potential, to be the best they can be. And, you know, Coach Latticer, the football coach at De La Salle, one of my best friends, we always used to talk about exactly what you said, that winning was just a byproduct of doing things the right way. And I, I firmly believe that. I think if you approach your life with the right spirit and that service is to be a great teammate and be a servant leader and also put yourself second for the good of the team, success does follow. Um, you know, my my greatest moments in, in sport, really, you, you mentioned some of the accolades that I have, but I always 
go back to one particular time, you know, that probably was my my greatest moment in connection with one of my final games you know, at De La Salle. And we had a, a great young player who um, during the year we had a chance to to win a ball game. We were up three points and he had a, a one and one to, to clinch the game. We couldn't have been in a better situation for best player with the ball. And he goes to the foul line for a one and one and he missed it. And quite frankly, he was shocked that he missed it. And he hesitated for a moment and they got the rebound through it. And the guy, you know, hit a three pointer from half court and tied us, went to overtime and we lost. And that boy really struggled with that. And that night I was home about 11 o'clock at night and I get a phone call from one of my assistants who said that he was down at the uh, uh, church, you know, shooting free throws. And um, I, he says, not, he's not doing well, you know. So I got in my car and I drove down to talk to him and I said, you know, Sometimes we are selected, uh, you know, God only selects those to fail that are capable of failing, that have the strength to fail. And I said, and you were chosen to miss tonight, but it's it doesn't define you. You know, it's an opportunity. You're going to come back and you're going to come back stronger. You cannot let this moment define you. And as you know, Jeff. No one, the last play never costs you a game. Like this, the, you know, the, uh, the championship game, we watched the AFC game. Everybody's pointing to that last play. It wasn't the last play. You had, you know, all that time prior to that, you, you, who defines what was the turning point in that particular game. And just as I said to him, you know, it, it certainly wasn't on him at all. Right. And so he went back there and I said, I, I guarantee you're going to get another chance to come back and, and have an opportunity to, to make it the next time. And we went through the rest of the year and we ended up playing that same exact team in the section championship game. And um, he, we were down nine with a little over a minute to go. And this boy spurred a comeback, which was legendary. And he brought us back and we actually, uh, we cut it to down one and he made a steal with one second to go. And they were, we were in a double bonus and he had two shots to win the game. And he looked at me and he pointed at me and he hit his heart and I hit my heart. And like, this is the moment we've waited for. And you know, he went to the foul line and he, and he missed the first end and he missed the second. And that boy was devastated. He crashed to the ground. The fans stormed the court because we had been beaten. And I just remember walking over and picking that kid up and holding him and looking him in the eyes. And I was rocking him and saying how much I loved him and how proud I was. And he kept saying, I choked. I choked. I said, you didn't choke at all. First of all, we were down nine. You brought us back single handedly. You put us in a position to win. And there'll be other days and you've got to gain strength from this. And the, the reason we play sport is not for those championship moments. It's for moments like that. And I can tell you to the day I die, that was my finest moment as a coach, because I really didn't care that we had lost the game. I was I had to be there to, to provide guidance and lessons for him and let him know that I loved him and I cared for him. And I always would and that there would be another time. And it may not be in a sport. You know, it may be in a life when he has a crisis at home or has to deal with a child with an illness or the loss of a parent. These are the kinds of things that we are coaching for and trying to lead for. So your quote was absolutely perfect and, and really does resonate for me, because I do think that is the key to to leadership. Mm, man, what a great and incredible story. And yes, yeah, sports uh, provide such a platform to be life's teacher. You know, if we can get it. uh are focused on just that, you know, and hopefully helping our athletes learn how to compete and push themselves and then just be okay. Cause many times the other team's just better. Uh, right. and you got to just take your hat off to them and then, all right, Hey, well focus on the things that we did well, let's learn from it. Uh, and then move on. Um, and, uh, you mentioned early when you started, uh, speaking about a uh, servant leadership. And I just want to tell the listeners, you know, Mike and I don't know coach, uh, Mike and I played basketball at the university of San Francisco, which is where coach works. Now I reached out to the director of operations, not to throw him under the bus. Don't even remember his name, but wanted to get some tickets to a game, uh, and never heard back, uh, from him. And so I just go onto the USF website and I'm looking for a phone number. Uh, and your uh, name came up with your phone number. So I call up coach again, haven't ever met him. Uh, and uh, he is just the, exactly what he says, a servant leader. And so, hey, Jeff, nice to meet you. Uh, what can I do for you? I say, coach, you know, me and my, my roommate and my best friend uh, are coming. To, would love to come to a game. And all right, let me do what I can to get you fixed up. And next thing I know, he's emailing me and saying, hey, we got you three tickets. Uh, and then got to go meet coach at the game. And uh, yeah, just a man of his word. I just wanted to say thanks uh, for all that you've done uh, for me and Mike and Paul, you know, our other best friend. We had a great time at the game. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure to assist. 
Yeah. So let's get in. Uh, let's go back. And this is a broad uh, question, but what was life like growing up for you? You know, I, I always say I was really, really blessed. Uh, I, I really was. I mean, I had two amazing parents who were uh, faith filled people that really were, were leaders, you know, before serving leaders, before that became a word, you know, I, I, I grew up in a household. My dad was a factory worker, so we didn't, we didn't have a, a lot of money. My mother's a crossing guard. Uh, we lived in a nice home. My grandfather lived with us, which helped, you know, my grandfather lived with us, which was a real blessing. You know, having him in our lives uh, every day, you know, uh, sharing the same bedroom with my grandfather, who was a, uh, an incredible, incredible man. But, you know, I watched my father do, so many different things. You know, he cut lawns on weekends to make extra money. He was a great athlete, but he didn't play. He umpired instead. He used to clean the church. And, you know, my mom did the same thing. So they were always doing odd jobs and stuff to kind of be able to, you know, provide for the four boys that we had uh, in our family. Uh, my, my brothers were still, you know, lifelong buddies to this day. Uh, and luckily I was, I was the third, you know, so I got to look at the example of the first two and, and kind of, and kind of watch how they, they, they grew. But our house was interesting because my dad's best friend was always the parish priest and they were in our home a lot. So, you know, they, every Tuesday night, Father Darty came and had dinner with us, uh, we also knew that was a day we could be late for dinner and dad wouldn't yell at us in front of the priest. So that was a good thing to get to play a little basketball a little bit longer. But we always had people of faith in our in our family. Uh, uh, and so we, we got to we got we really got a good spiritual base. And I think I took that uh, that that background into my into my coaching, you know, even at a public school when you really can't integrate faith into it. We there's a way to integrate spirituality, which is, you know, togetherness and and it's discipline and it's love and it's sacrifice. And these are all key words that really um, they, they really work in any faith. Right. At the core of everything needs to be discipline and love and sacrifice for your fellow man. And I was actually thinking about that last night. My son lost a very tough game to Camp Alindo last night. They were down you know, like 19 points and came back and made a heck of a run to cut it to two possessions at the end. But, you know, at the end of I was I was just thinking about, you know, that that whole experience. And with his young team, you know, the growth that they have to make, the growth that they have to make. It's not on the court. It's it's really that whole idea of, of putting yourself second, you know, about how do I get somebody else open? You know, sometimes the best play is to penetrate and kick it to somebody else. You know, it's not trying to shoot that ball. And I do think that comes with experience and with understanding the whole big picture that I've always felt that, you know, we, we use that term. Um, he makes people around him better. What an incredible thing to say about people, right? Um, that they make, they make people around you better. Now, just, not just as a player, you know, that quarterback that makes you look better, the point guard, but, but also as a, as a leader. You know, one of my favorite people in the world is John Moore, you know, coached at Westmont for many years and an outstanding coach. He's currently an assistant in San Diego working with his brother-in-law, Steve Lavin. And every time I see Coach Moore, I always leave and tell him this. I said, you know, I I, I, I hate to say this. I know it embarrasses you, and, but I say it with all sincerity. Every time I'm with Coach Moore, I always leave challenged to be a better man because I watch the way he lives his life with the integrity that he does and his commitment to his faith and, and his leadership. And so I think to me that that's what makes winning teams, right? When you have, when you can get people to buy into that concept, it isn't about me. You know, it's about the team and what little thing can I do? Maybe that best play is a backside rebound. You know, um, it, it doesn't have to be that guy that makes 25 points. You know, maybe your role is to is to just be a great teammate and to pick uh, pick uh, pick others up. And I don't know if there's a greater gift than that than to make people around you better. Mm, 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 mm. I love it. I'm not going to get into it a whole bunch, but I I love hearing how you grew up because I have eight brothers and sisters, including me, uh, oh. Catholic Catholic family. Only 10 year little little more than 10 years difference between the oldest and the youngest five boys, three girls. I was the youngest boy. And so I had uh, four great role models uh, ahead of me uh, and always had priests and nuns uh, at the house. Um, and so just, yeah, just listening to you, I yeah, I can picture your house because I kind of grew up uh, in that one. And then back to, you know, friendship and, and dedication. That's where I'm honored to get to spend so much time with Mike and then my other best friend. And you just need a couple people in your life to be that foundation for you. And when you can find that on a team and build that culture, it's magic, you yes. know, but why is it so hard? And I'm just, I mean, my well, team, I'm coaching a team this year and we're so far from that, you know, and, and, and I'm embarrassed to say that because I'm the head coach 
I run this nonprofit where that's what I do. I help businesses and other teams build culture. And then I can't even do it for my team this year. And we're just struggling with that. And we haven't come together as a team at all. Uh, yeah. I've been tried every last trick that I could and our season's getting ready to be over and I'm going to leave this season with just the worst feeling in my stomach from like, man, I just, we never got started and it just is burning inside me of like, ah, so why do you, why is it so darn hard? Well, Jeff, I think there's a number of reasons, but, but, uh, but uh, before I get into the reasons and remind me to get back to that, but I, I also think that, you know, sometimes that success comes later. You know, you're feeling like, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're evaluating yourself based on the camaraderie of the team and them coming together and wins and losses, et cetera. But, you know, maybe the long-term goals they're going to get, I always say that everybody eventually gets it right. And the great teams and the great players get it earlier, right. They figure it all out. You know, so I said, I was blessed. You know, I figured it out at a really young age, I in sixth grade, I knew I was going to Notre Dame. You know, I had made that commitment. I, I I knew what I wanted and I knew what I had to do to get there. And sometimes kids today just just don't see it yet. You know, they have a million distractions. You know, I have a grandson who could be a really, really good player, you know, and uh, it's all going to depend on whether he gets to fire or not. But I also know that he likes to play video games and I like to he likes to do a lot of things that you know, with COVID in particular, these kids really were forced home, you know, and, and did a lot of online things and played a lot of video games and in some ways, a lot of kids are addicted to that. And so they're not really getting the interpersonal relationships that build that that team strength, you know, et cetera. But in terms of, you know, your coaching, I mean, yeah, we, we evaluate it short term. It looks like you didn't do what you wanted to do. Right. But but those lessons come long term. You know, I've had so many players. Uh, you know, I had a one who was a point guard, a terrific player who really never bought into us. I could tell, you know, and it did affect our play. You know, we really never had a great team, you know, uh, when when he when he was there and he had a, a lot of wins. He's a great player. And but I, and I knew he didn't totally buy into it. And, and he went to college and played. He was a terrific player in college. And I went to watch him play. And one game, he apolo- after a game, he apologized to me. He said, you know, I never believed in all the stuff you were teaching and and all that. And he said, um, and then I came to college and I realized that it's really not about togetherness. It's not about winning. You know, people are playing for themselves. And Jeff, this is going back, you know, probably uh, 10, 15 years ago. It's worse now with the NIL and the transfer portal. We're encouraging kids to play for themselves now. Right. So he said, I never really understood, you know, what you were trying to get teach me, but I do now. And I apologize. And I know we could have been better. And I said, well, it doesn't matter what we were. It just matters that you got it now. Right. Well, he called me last year. He's coaching high school down in L.A. And he called me, he said, coach, I have to tell you, you know, at all the coaches I ever had, you're probably the greatest culture creator I ever met. And I'm trying to create this culture with this program. And he said, and the kids just aren't getting it, you know? And I said, well, the first step is to realize your coach didn't get it. You know, it took you a while to get it. And you have to look at this long term. You know, if you're really a leader of this, it's really not about those wins and losses and those championships. As you said earlier, that's the byproduct of, of, of all this stuff. But really at the end of the day, it's, what I said, you won your state title now that you're coaching and now you'll have that direct impact on, you know, 45 kids in your program year after year. Uh, That's the beauty of sport. That's the gift that we are, are given as leaders. But I do think you have to really focus on that. You know, the public evaluates us on wins and losses, et cetera. But there's an old coaches saying that I have, and uh, I had it on my desk every year I coached and it said, by your own soul, you learn to live. And if men thwart you, take no heed. If men hate you, have no care. Dream your dream, sing your song, hope your hope, and pray your prayer. And I lived by that as a coach, that when I was criticized or a parent was unhappy, I'd walk away saying, I know who I am. I know why I'm doing this. I know what my goals are in terms of trying to change young people's lives. And that's what I'm going to do. And if you don't appreciate that, that's fine. You don't have to, you know. And then on another note, too, you know, when you look at parents today and how difficult and every coach will say it's difficult to deal with parents, et cetera. Now, I was just to have the approach that and I would talk to the, the child afterward, you know, after the parent came in and I always had a rule where the parent had to be the, the child had to be with the parent when we met. And because the kid, because the kid knows what's going on, right? So the parent would say, "My son's the best player," and I'd say, "Where do you when we pick teams? Where do you get picked?" Well, ninth, you know. And uh, but but you know, when the parent would leave, oftentimes the player would be a little embarrassed, you know. And I'd say, you know, don't be embarrassed. That's just your parents love you, you know. They this is their way of showing their love. They want what's best for you. 
too. Now, they may not be aware at practice every day of what we're seeing, and their goal is to have you play. My goal, and hopefully your goal, is to make you the best student you can be, ultimately the best citizen you can be, and be a great parent someday and, and, and lead others. Mm, I love it. You have so many great parts uh, uh, of who you are just as a man and and role modeling that for all the young men that have been uh, in your life and now are leading others. So let me just get right to the the title of the show at this point in your life. You know, what are your life's essential ingredients? And let me let you think about that for a second, because I want to put it in perspective for the listeners. Uh, I told you we got to go to the USF game and I knew what coach looked like. And so I was looking for him because I wanted to give him a gift and finally tracked him down. But you don't know, but I was watching you all game long and he never sat down. He kept moving and he must have talked to every last person uh, in certain sections of the gym. And there was thousands of of people there. Uh, And so back to the question, you know, what what are your life's essential ingredients right now? And how do you more specifically, how do you do what you do? Where do you get your energy? What's part of your routine? And, and maybe there's a listener that's like, yeah, I can incorporate that into my life. Well, you know, I, I really do approach it. I just want to make you know the lives of others better. You know, I want to raise them up. You know, um, you know, I, I have an old uh, a teacher that uh, I called him about a week or two ago. He's he was our class advisor at New Providence High School, and uh, uh, I was a senior class president. And uh, and I remember interacting with him and. And Mrs. Sardella, there was my uh, and Miss Hazley. There was the three, the three people. There, my there, there are student advisors, and uh, Miss Hazley passed away. But the other two, I still talk to them all the time. You know, uh, I'll give them a call periodically, and and I always tell Mr. Arichetto, I said, you sent me something many, many years ago. Um, it was in a Christmas card, and it said, "There is a destiny that makes us brothers. No one walks their path alone. All that we put into the lives of others comes back into our own." And so I that's the way I approach my life. You know, when I go to a game, I'm there to to say hello to people and make them feel good and ask them how their daughter's doing and how their job is and and whatnot. I want them to feel good. I want them to enjoy the experience, know that somebody cares about them. Right. And so you're right. I do spend most of my time going around and saying hello to people and visiting with people, making sure they're happy and and enjoying the experience, because I do believe USF is a special place. You know, it's uh, why I went there. You know, you you had you had the chance to go there, you know, and I always think of that sign honor over glory. You know, when you think about the 51 Dons and you know, the opportunity to go to a bowl game and they turned it down because the Orange Bowl committee said you can't bring your black players. And I just think to forfeit all of that on on a principle. And, you know, I heard that story. That's that's where I want to be. You know, I want to I want to be a part of that. So, you know, I'm really blessed to be part of an institution that really has been at the forefront of social change, you know, for 70 years. <laughs> right. It's been who they are. And, you know, there's signs that, um, you know, there's signs all over that city change the world from here. Well, I think we can change the world from here one thing at a time, you know, one act of kindness to a time, saying hello to somebody that might be having a bad day or asking them how the construction of their home is coming along and just making them feel the best we can possibly make them feel. In essence, makes me feel better. You know, going back to that quote, if I, anything I put in the lives of others comes back into mine, you know, thousand, thousands times over. And I really always say, you know, I, I have truly been blessed because, you know, my wheelhouse was the East Bay. Right. I've run my camps. You know, almost everybody has gone to my camp at some point in time in East Bay. I really didn't have any connections in San Francisco. Well, now I, you know, when I when I got this job, Jeff, you'll appreciate this. I called Bob Latticer, the football coach at De La Salle, and, and Bob was retired then. And I said, Bob, you know, I you know, went there to coach, you know, with, with Rex Walters, one of the best offensive minds I've ever been around, by the way. And I went to coach with Rex as the associate head coach. And then when there was a coaching change and you know, and I wasn't going to be coaching on the staff anymore. Um, the athletic director, Scott Sidwell, called me and he said, you know, I'd like you to come work with me. And I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I'm not an athletic administrator. I'm a coach. And he just said, you know, come around, follow me and learn. Just listen and learn. And uh, was an education working with him and, you know, watching the outreach that he did. And and I called Coach Latticer and I said, Bob, I feel like I still got some coaching in me here. You know, I've got some innovative things I'd like to try defensively, et cetera. And I said, what do you think I should do? And he said, Coaching to you is never about winning and losing. Coaching to you is about spreading the gospel. He said, so why in the heck would you not go to the San Francisco where you have, you know, 
750,000 people, you, this whole community that, that you have not had any relationship with, you get a chance to coach all those people. Why would you limit yourself to coach 15 people when you can go and coach a community, you know, and help mentor and go work with youth groups and CYO programs in San Francisco and the Boys and Girls Clubs and Salesian Boys Club and the Olympic Club and all these great places that, you know, I get to be a part of and invite people to games and bring them to the lobby and show them the new Hall of Fame and give them a tour and tell them about my passion for USF and maybe get some of them inspired to maybe want to come there someday and be change makers as well. So, you know, I, it's, it's, that's, that's really what motivates me. Just that opportunity that I feel like in giving to others, it enriches me um, much more than I ever could on my own. Well, coach, I was just about to ask a similar question. You just answered. It's like you're a mind reader. That's why he's a great coach, Basho. But I'm kind of curious, you're a legendary high school coach. And now, as far as coaching young people on the court, your role is different. What is it you miss the most about being that head coach, about running that program? No, that, that I mean, that, that the the thing that I miss the most is that culture creation. I just loved taking a group of of of, of young men, and you know, I coached I coached girls as well, um, and CYO for many years. But I just love taking a group and and making them a team. You know, and probably my proudest accomplishments is all those kids are very good friends. I don't have any teams out there that still aren't a team. You know, those guys are still very close. They're about, I mean, the 2000 state championship team, those guys are the best of friends. You know, they, they, they just are. And so I'm really proud that I was able to give them relationships and, and to get a kid to buy in. You know, I think we have two choices in, in life, right? We can always say, well, you know, um, she doesn't listen to me when I when I tell her what to do, you know, or this and, you know, she's got a bad attitude or, you know, the family situation is a very difficult one. We can always make excuses and we can always give up or we can say, hey, it's my job, you know, to try and move that person to doing it the right way. Those are our choices either. And, and I think that was the fun part to me was honing my skills psychologically. Every 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 person has a button and you got to find that button. You know, what resonates with that child and how do you communicate with them to get them to believe in peak performance? And it's got to that it's got to come from them. All great teams take ownership of it. You know, it's not I used to tell my teams, you know, there are two things I would say to them and say, hey, I'm going to be here for a long time. This is your shot. You know, so you got to give your best effort. You get to do this for one year. This is your senior year. You know, I'm coming back. You know, and the other thing I would do at the end of a game, I'd say, you know, to, to the kids, they say, hey, this is your call. You know, we've got a minute to go, man. I always believe the teams that want to win the most are the ones that win at the end of games. So who's willing to make that backside play? Who's willing to dive on the floor for a, a loose ball? Who's willing to penetrate and kick to get somebody a wide up and shot? You know, most of the time you see kids think they have to do it on their own, right? They go one-on-one -on -one and try to break it down. There's five people condensed and help side. Those teams don't win. It's those teams that understand teamwork and trust and loyalty. And those are things that, you know, I, I miss teaching to, to young people to try to get that to become who, who they are. If you were to meet some of my players, Jeff and Mike, you, 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 you and talk to them. You, they're like clones. You know, we, we all have the same message, right? Because they've heard it over and over and over. And you know, with, with, you know, Jeff said earlier, it would really resonated with me about the quotes, right? You said you do a quote before every, um, you know, before every every show that you do. Well, I, I had a quote before every day, you know, every day the kids got a card from me that had a motivational saying on it. And we talk about it. And sometimes I would see it on the floor and I'd be disappointed, you know, like, well, they're not really getting my message. And then I would go to the child's home for graduation. The mother would say, here, I want to show you his bedroom. And I'd go up and there's, you know, 380, you know, things on his closet door, you know, with motivational uh, sayings. On there, you know, I remember John MacArthur was one of my favorite players. He was player of the year in Northern California senior year, went to Santa Clara on a scholarship. And I loved coaching John. He was that kind of a guy. And uh, I remember well, there was one game at halftime. We were losing to Damon Lillard. We were getting killed and he was killing us. And at halftime, I went around that room and I just challenged guys one by one saying, hey, what kind of a guy are you? How are you going to be remembered? How will I remember you? Because right now I'm seeing guys that are backing down, you know, we're intimidated and we're a lot of things. And, and at the end, I pointed to John MacArthur and I said, no matter what happens tonight, 
honor him because he is a gladiator. We had just watched a movie clip of gladiator when they carried him out. I said, carry him out on your shoulders tonight because that man is a gladiator. I think John went for like 40 points in the second half. In fact, it's a great clip on YouTube. If you just put in John MacArthur de La Salle, you'll see him making baskets and pointing to me and pounding his heart, right? Like I want to play with you and for you forever, right? It was one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. Came back and we won the game. I saw John at a USF game and asked him what he was doing. And he told me what he was doing. He's very successful. And he said, I carry quotes you gave with me all the time. Right. And he said, I have one here. I'm going to show you. He pulled it out of his wallet. Right. And he said, I list, I read this before every sales call that I go on. And I used to, this was my state, you know, finals that, that when we got into March in the playoffs, this was the quote we really talked about on the shores of hesitation by the countless millions of bleach bones who at the dawn of victory stopped to rest and in resting, they perished. Right. And I just love that we use that to teach our approach to March. And John uses it in his work that I, I'm, I'm this close. I'm about to close this deal. I got to get over the top. So that's really, you know, when you go back to my days in New Jersey and, and through high school and college and the mentorship that I had, that all those lessons that I got through the vehicle of sport pre prepared me for this journey of life to handle adversity and to embrace adversity and to embrace love and discipline and, and, and again, have the gift to be able to transmit to young people. And now in my new coaching role to adults. Mm, mm, man, such great stories. And, and I have to ask, did you, you mentioned, you know, carry off on the, on their shoulders uh, and loyalty. Um, so sorry if this comes across the wrong way, but did you play, I think you played with Rudy, one of my favorite movies. Yep, yep, like the inside scoop on, uh, on Rudy and, and how was, how was that? Well, Rudy was, Rudy was, um, you know, I was a quarterback that we got Rudy, Rudy got in the game, right? We scored the touchdown. If you go on YouTube, put in the real Rudy play, you'll see Frank Alaco leading the Irish. And I actually had hair too coming out of the helmet. <laughs> yeah, we scored the touchdown and got, got Rudy, Rudy in the game. Rudy was an interesting story because I'm going to tell you, that guy was like five, eight, you know, 175 pounds playing defensive end and getting beat up. You know, he was on the prep team and the prep team was rough, man. I mean, you're going against all Americans and, and he just, I've never seen a tougher guy. I mean, he just every day came back and back for more, you know, and I'll tell you something else. He, he, uh, the greatest boxing match I ever saw was Rudy. Um, he boxed a, a guy named Tom Bake, who was a running back and a terrific running back at Notre Dame. But um, they they bought we, Notre Dame used to have the Bengal bouts and all of the proceeds from the Bengal bouts went to the charities in Bangladesh. And uh, there was some great, great boxing. And you'd have to enroll in this class and you trained all year and then you got to do this event. Well, there was t t t two great events that night. It was Ross Browner, who was number one pick in the draft, against Ken McAfee. That was the heavyweight fight. Kevin, but you know, Ken, Ken, uh, Kenny was a tight end for the 49ers. Either two unbelievable guys. They were the heavyweight. But Rudy and Tom Bake, they went, you know, punch for punch. I have never seen anybody. <laughs> you know, those guys never stopped. They just drilled each other. But Rudy goes down, you know, respect in my book, just as one of the toughest people I've, I have ever seen in my life. And obviously it was a storybook how the, everything came together and he made the sack and, and, you know, and got to go out and, and do the things that he's done with his life. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. And I, I know the movies always build it up, but just how he totally changed the trajectory of his life, but the life of his siblings. And he just wanted something different. And he had that belief, just like you said, in the sixth grade, I knew I was going to Notre Dame. I don't know when it clicked for him, but he knew he was going. Uh, and then just how he just took action and, and totally changed his life. Um, just incredible. And speaking of taking action and, and prepping for this episode, uh, I think you had when you were coaching on the sidelines, you had a legendary foot stomp. Is that true? Let's talk true. about that. That's true. So that that happened. You know, it's funny. Every time we'd play in a state championship game, uh, um, I would do it and a referee would come over and say, you know, I'm going to give you a, a technical. You do that again. I said, well, well, I'm not doing that at you. Uh, this is what I do. You know, it's just it's my thing, you know, and and here's how that happened. We when I was at Northgate used to play three games in a row in the championship game. You'd play Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So Saturday 
I couldn't talk. I have a really bad voice. You know, if I had a good voice, I wouldn't be coaching. I'd be playing the guitar in Central Park somewhere, you know, because I'd love to play the guitar and sing. But I have a very weak voice. It gets tired very easily. And so um, third day, I was talking like this. And uh, I remember Dave Gregory, one of the referees, I went up to him. I said, Dave, I said, I, I can't talk. You know, my voice is shot. Right? I was telling me before the game and all that. And so um, I during the game, I stopped my foot first time to get their attention because I to change defenses i had a lot of everything i did was with signals right because we always planned on being at arco and i said you're not gonna be able to hear me so everything was hand signals they'd look at me and i'd do something fast and they they knew what it meant right so i stopped my foot you know to get their attention and he gives me a t and he comes over and i go dave what are you doing i told you i can't talk you know i'm not doing this for you i'm trying to get their attention right but that's what i would do i never did it in anger or you know, uh, but I, I'm telling you, people will tell you it was I don't care where I was. When I hit that foot, it just reverberated through the whole arena. There could be 10,000 people at Arco and you'd hear that stomp and everybody would bristle. But that's how I would change offenses or defenses to get to get their attention. But, yeah, uh, there's a lot of people that are doing that now and emulating it. But I tell you, don't do it because most of my knees are had to be repaired. from it. <laughs> Uh, Coach, I hate to tell you, but uh, Jeff stole that foot stop from you. He does it all the time. (laughs) Every now and then, you got to be on the sideline, have a good foot stomp. Uh, Yeah. So, yeah, I do some crazy things occasionally. But uh, obviously, Coach, you've had some great mentors in your life. And I know when you came out west, um, after you wised up a little bit, you, you crossed paths with John Dugan. Tell the listeners about uh, what he has meant to you and the influence that he's had on on your life and your career. You know, I just I've always believed that, you know, there's no coincidences in life. You know, my brother Jerry was an amazing high school coach and really learned a lot from Jerry. I mean, he really was the guy for us. We were little kids. You know, he had motivational sayings and adhesive tape on his wall. Right. We would go by Jerry's bedroom and he had it all on the wall. He was six years older than me. But. You know, we really became Jerry. You know, we really did. All of us became became him. And Jerry always says there's no coincidences. Everything in your life is there because you've drawn it there. And John Dugan was one of those people that came into my life. I was probably my early 20s and um, coaching CYO and trying to give kids opportunities. And, you know, I played coach here at St. Agnes in Concord. And then um, I wanted to get involved in San Francisco, you know, to give our kids experiences to play kids in Oakland and San Francisco. And I met John Dugan and John was just this unbelievable guy, but talk about a commitment to kids. I mean, he's been a master coach his whole life. He's still coaching over at San Ignatius. You know, he's just a a legendary guy. And so I got to know him and he took a liking to me and, and we hit it off very, very easily. And then he started bringing his young son, John to my camp. So he would drive him every day from San Francisco to come to my basketball camp. And that's the faith that he had in what we were teaching. And, you know, John went on to be an incredible player at St. Ignatius and then at the University of San Francisco. Uh, But John exposed me to CYO and the Flame Tournament and some of these other things. And so John was one of my early mentors and really got me kind of excited about CYO. And that, again, the offshoot of that, you know, think of how many kids have benefited because John Dugan got me involved you know, with CYO, because then I branched out and started, you know, doing things there as well. And then I became, you know, an administrator in our league here. And as I said, I'm still the president, you know, of that CYO. I've been administrator for 47 years, you know, in CYO. And so that all started with John Dugan, you know, and and I want to backtrack on one thing. I I do want to talk about my other mentors, but think about that. I mean, you talk about Rudy, you know, and you, you talk about, well, Rudy made some fame and fortune out of that, but who are the real beneficiaries of the Rudy story? It's the kids that now on that Rudy plan they have there were kids that don't get into Notre Dame, you know, go to Holy Cross College and they get to do a year there. And if they have the grades and, you know, excel, they get to they get admission to Notre Dame. That was a path that was created, you know, by Rudy getting in, quite frankly. So think about that. You know, it's really not the fame and fortune that he got. And uh, I'm not even sure he probably realizes that. But, you know, the impact that that has had, his enrollment has gotten in uh, a lot of kids at Notre that wouldn't have gotten in. So we never know what that touch is going to be long time. So John Dugan's chance meeting with me, you know, was, was really the catalyst for all the things that, that I've done. Yeah, I remember I had uh, two of my brothers play basketball at West Valley 
uh, college in Saratoga and they were really good. And they always would go up uh, uh, against uh, city college, of San Francisco, where coach Dugan was coaching. And those games were just so fun. Uh, and, and we all went to Mitty high school in San Jose. And so St. Ignatius was a, just a fun place. It, it was all boys at that time. And uh, the gym was always packed. They were always in your face, just pointing the whole time and standing up and uh, just, yeah, good memories of uh, just being in the city and playing. Uh, but let's get into your Excel because I know you started that in 1981 um, and uh, just, man, just everything that you've done is just so selfless. Uh, of giving back to the game and empowering uh, young people to be themselves. So just give a quick little blurb on that. So people know that it's out there and I know you make videos, uh, inspirational videos and uh, yeah, anybody that uh, wants to tap into that, let them know how they can do that. Well, my website has all the videos. I like you, Jeff, I did it during COVID. You know, I, I would talk to kids. We couldn't have camp during COVID and uh I would talk to kids, say, what do you miss about camp? I miss the motivational talks. I would give two little talks a day and uh, little anecdotes. And and again, I would I would go into these meetings with kids. I have, you know, 200 kids at camp, 250 kids. And I would just walk in. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. And I would just get in front of them and boom, something would come to me and I'd give a little motivational lesson. So I said, you know, we can still do that. We can't do camp, but I can get these messages out. So I started doing these videos and sending them out during COVID. And I did them weekly. You know, through COVID, I did uh, probably, you know, I think I did 50 plus of them. I got to get back to doing them. I've been so busy, you know, lately with my work at USF at the Hall of Fame and other projects that I've been involved in. I've gotten away from it, but I got I, I have to get I really do have to get back to that. But Excel, again, another another incredible turn of events. There's no coincidences. I had was blessed to meet a guy named Stu Aberdeen at a basketball camp when I was a kid. Uh, I was probably 16 years old and I was at Pocono Invitational Basketball Camp in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. And they had a speaker one afternoon. He came in and he was from the University of Tennessee. He was a small guy, about five foot four inches tall. And he wore all orange in honor of Tennessee. And back then you didn't wear, you wore short shorts. He wore long shorts down to his knees and he had orange sweat uh, socks that went up to his knees and orange socks. And, you know, and here was this guy that came out as, and, and some of the guys at camp were kind of laughing at him when he came out to speak, man. And this guy started to speak and, I was mesmerized by him. You know, he talked about how we're all created equal, but how do you get that edge? You know, you've got to find the winning edge he talked about. And the winning edge was in every aspect of your life, finding to find a separator, you know, and uh, he asked the camp, he said, who's the best player in this camp? And of course, nobody wanted to, to say anything. And then the mumbling started and my name was getting mentioned. I used to go and wash dishes at camp so I could go for free. I washed dishes for six weeks, six weeks a year um, in the basement. And so I could go for free. And and so I had been the MVP three of the first four weeks. And this is week five. And Stu comes in and says, you know, who's the best friends camp? Finally, he's me a lock. He said, OK, which guy's a lock? Stand up. And I stand up and he says, how good are you? Well, I'm thinking, well, my junior year, you know, I made all east. So north, south, east, west, northeast, southeast. You know, there's probably eight regions in the country, you know, 10 kids on a team, 80, top 100. I can't say that. I'll come across a little too cocky. I said, I, I don't know, probably probably in the top you know, 500 kids in the country. He looked at me. He said, I can look at you right now and tell you you're not in the top 500 kids in the country. He said, you know, I've got four scholarships. Tell me why I would give it to you. What's going to separate you? There's probably 2,000 kids as good as you. How do you whittle down that pool? First thing he said, he goes, I want a kid that doesn't drink or smoke or do drugs. And he said that eliminated this. I want a kid who's, um, you know, goes to church on Sundays. I want a kid that doesn't use foul language. I want a kid that has grades. And every time he's doing that, he's giving a number. We're down to, you know, 800, 600. I want to want somebody who respects their parents. He goes, yeah, we just went down to 20. You know, we're getting there. And then every time he, he would do that, he'd cut it down. He goes, now I've got my 10 players that I want to recruit. And you think about that in your coaching, Jeff, you know, when you have those kids that do all those things, they tend to be the better players and the kids that get the message and, and compete. So that day he changed my life. You know, and I just said, I've got to change some of the things I'm doing and, and try to try to excel and, and use your time. You know, I I implemented that that same thing when I went into business. I always felt like, you know, the, in basketball, if I shoot a thousand shots a day and you don't, who's going to shoot better? You know, you've got to shoot. You've got to put your repetitions in. You know, if you're coaching and half your time is spent speaking and my my guys are doing drills the whole time, we're getting better. You know, we're picking up 
that time, they were picking up the repetitions because life truly is, you know, a, a game of repetition. So that was the message I got from Coach Abedin. And, and um, um, so about, geez, years later, I was in a sales a sales thing and I was flying over to Hawaii. Was, Hawaii was my territory. And I, I never read the San Francisco Chronicle that day. I was sitting at the gate. I picked it up, started reading the sports page. Little paragraph, Coach Stu Aberdeen, head coach, Marshall University, died. He was 49 years old. He had a massive heart attack. I called my wife, who was my girlfriend when I went to camp, and I said, Stu Aberdeen died. And she knew the impact he had on me. I said, I cannot believe it. I said, and he got a paragraph. This man who changed so many lives, he got a paragraph. He deserved more. And that night I, I went to bed and I actually dreamt my camp right down to the logo. And I called my brother, Jerry, who was a very successful coach in New Jersey. And I said, Jerry, I'm going to start a basketball camp and I'm going to dedicate it to Stu Aberdeen's memory. I'm going to give his message of the winning edge to kids. And I'm going to become, I'm going to keep him alive. I'm going to give him immortality. Right. And, and, and I created the Stu Aberdeen outstanding player award and talk about him at camp and tell the story about, you know, my meeting with him and the challenges that he gave. And, and so that's really why the camp started. And the camp has been, you know, it's in New Jersey and in California, running on both coasts. It's still incredibly successful. And it really is successful because it's never been about, I didn't go into that to make money. I didn't, it was never, you know, never even my goal. I couldn't care less. You know, I very rarely raised the price. It's just, it's just there to serve kids. I went in it and then I'll give you a great quote. I know you're a quote guy, guy right? I always put the success of any venture will be determined by the spirit in which it was entered. I didn't go into the campus just to make money on the side. I went to the campus to change lives. And it's always been my ministry and it's always been my passion. And it continues to be that today. So, and that's why the camp is as successful as it is. If you had to define leadership, how would you define that? Well, you know, I, I think I, I, I point to someone. Um, I think Eric Parsegan uh, my college football coach was one of the greatest leaders, if not one of the top 10 men ever born. I mean, he was a unique, unique, unique man. And, you know, sometimes with time, you know, memories fade and people don't understand the impact that that man had. Uh, I have never met a classier human being in my life. I think a great leader not only says the words, but he lives the words. And to me, that is that is real leadership. Anybody can go on YouTube and, and Google a motivational speech and give it right. But but the message is profound when you become that, when you lead it and great leaders model the behavior, you know, like you just said about me, you know, going around at the USF games and saying hello to people. Well, well, maybe someone's going to see that and do the same thing. You know, you have to model that. You just can't you know, say those words. And Coach Parsegan uh, we I'll never forget the Orange Bowl in 1972. We played uh, Nebraska, incredible team, you know, with uh, David Hum, Johnny Rogers, one of the greatest college football players I ever saw in my life. They beat us 40 to six. And Coach Parsegan came in the locker room, you know, at the end of that game. And this was his talk. He said, gentlemen, I want you to remember this as long as you live. Adversity has the effect of eliciting talent, which under prosperous conditions might have remained dormant. And he walked out of the room. And we were sitting there, you know, with those words, adversity has the effect of eliciting talents, which under prosperous conditions might have remained dormant. That became our battle cry all spring. That's all we, we talked about. And every one of us, we dug deep down inside of us to find skills that we didn't even know we had. And that team from the disastrous year, the year before, you know, we came together. And we went 11 and 0. We beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl to win the national championship. And again, to this day, those guys are the best of friends. So when you say this core of it, you know, teams don't come and go. The teams that come and go, they don't win. These teams that are eternal, that last forever, are those ones that have love and spirituality and friendship and faith, you know, at the core of all that, that's what that team had. So I want, and, I, and I'll tell you this, Jeff, that team was not that talented. You know, they really weren't. But I'll tell you, we had people that just would do anything, you know, for each other. Now, you flash forward after that, you know, flash forward many years. My father calls me one day and says that um, you have to watch 60 Minutes tonight because you know, he's in New Jersey and it's three hours later. You got to watch 60 Minutes. There's a profile on your coach. 
I said, what, what happened? What coach do? He says, no, just watch it. And I watched this show and coach Parsegan is painfully telling the story of his grandson who was walking on the playground and was falling down. His coordination was off and the school called the parents said something's wrong. And they needed me to get him checked out. Right. So he comes home and he's doing his homework. He can't keep his hand on the paper and, what's going on with our son, right? And they, they bring him to a specialist and he ends up going to Columbia Medical Center in New York and they discover that he had neiman pick c syndrome, a rare neurological disease where your body doesn't process cholesterol and it overtakes your brain and it shuts down all of your organs and your limbs. And it's an awful, awful uh, death. It's incurable. And Coach Parsegan gets this news. And um, they say it's a genetic disease. So you have to test all your grandchildren. Three of his four grandchildren had the disease. Uh, and Coach Parsegan decided to leave the broadcast booth and dedicate his life to finding a cure for this disease. So he told me his exact words. I went to a fundraiser in Berkeley and he said to me, I can't save mine, but I will dedicate my life that no parent, no grandparent will ever feel what our family is feeling. I said, Sort of like adversity has the effect of eliciting talents, which under prosperous conditions might have remained dormant. He lit up. He goes, I taught somebody something. I said, coach, if you ever knew anything I ever am or anything I'll ever accomplish in my life was at the core of what you taught me. And more important, what you what I saw you do, because that man was the greatest husband, father, grandfather you know, citizen, coach, you name it. I, there was never a better man. And I never heard that man say a, an evil thing about any human being. I mean, he's just the classiest person I ever met. So again, I talk about the blessings that I had with my parents and my high school coaches and Coach Parsegan that just didn't say the words. I got to watch them do that every single day. So to me, a leader is one that embraces principles that extend well beyond the short-term goal, which is the game and translates to a bigger picture of life. And also, you know, we grow in others. When we talk about that concept of Aberdeen and immortality, you know, and I hate to use that word to relate immortality to, you know, to any of figures, but, you know, to, to Jesus or anybody else, right? I don't pretend to imagine that. But our little piece of immortality is that a piece of us as coaches lives in every person that we've got to touch in our lives. And when that person goes on, a bit of you extends in them. And four generations from now, where anybody, nobody will even know who I was, they will know who I was just by having a piece of something instilled in me that I was. They might not know my name or what I did or who I was, but maybe those lessons will get passed down generationally, gener generationally and, and a little piece of me will live in, in those generations down the line. Or other coaches, too, that instill these great things in people. What a beautiful uh, just testament. To, to just live in and something to aim for and shoot for. And I know, again, you've done that your whole life. Uh, uh, we're almost wrapping this baby up, but I was hoping you can tell that your Harry Davis story uh, um, uh, I, in prepping for you, I just ran across that and I just think it's incredible and hoping you can share that with the listeners. It's an incredible story. It really is. And again, I get back to um, how there's no coincidences and how I do believe angels appear in your life when you least expect it. You know, I really, really do believe that. And uh, when I, when I got the starting job at Notre Dame, you know, I, I, I was a backup, you know, behind Tom Clements, who was an incredible quarterback. He was the offense coordinator for the green Bay Packers still is Tommy, a great, great player. And, um, I was his backup, you know, held for extra points and whatnot and got to play, but, you know, never really did get my goal of starting. And then during my senior year, Coach Parsegan came to me and said, we're going to apply to the NCA to get you an extra year of eligibility. Back then, uh, you had to redshirt. It was you had to be hurt at Notre Dame. They just didn't redshirt you like they do now. But so uh, we went back and I had hurt my pinkies. I still have a pinky that doesn't work. And, you know, that we applied for this extra year and I got it. And um I was so fired up and so excited that I got this year. And then devastating news, Coach Parsegan was going to retire, right? So he had decided to retire, and now we have a new coach. And I'm not sure, you know, how this is going to work out for me. But, you know, I decided to stay, and and everything was going great. You know, that winter, I would drive my car uh, to practice, and sometimes I would just honk the horn. I was so excited that I finally going to get my opportunity to do everything I dreamed of doing since I was a little boy. And so I went to church every day to kind of thank God for the opportunity that he gave me. And I went to this church in, uh, in South Bend. And one day I was, I was there after, during the end of the mass and this man walks in 
and he's in his 80s and um, he was freezing cold, shivering. And he sat in front of me and his face was he was had to cry. His tears were frozen in his face. And I'm looking at this guy and it reminded me of my grandfather. And I said, I got I got to meet this guy. Right. So as soon as mass ended, I walked up and I said, are you OK? And he said, yeah, I said, you're late. And he said, yeah, I rode my bike here, you know, in his 80s. Right. And and um, so I said, where do you live? And he told me where he lived. And so we started going to church together. I would sit with him and we started to talk. And then one day I said, so how do you spend your days? And he said his name was uh, Jefferson Davis. When I first met him, he said he was the president of the Confederacy. And so he played along with that for a while. But uh, Harry Davis, I started, you know, I said, what do you do with your day? And he said, well, I go visit my wife. I said, where's your wife? She goes, oh, she's in the Highland Cemetery. And I said, well, wh where, where's that? He goes, well, I ride my bike. It takes me about three hours to get there. And oftentimes the bus, you know, the trucks was on highway. The trucks would splatter him and he would fall off his bike. And I said, I'll tell you what, I don't have class till 1030. Um, uh, this is my fifth year there. Right. And so I said, um, how about I pick you up and I take you to church every day and then we'll take a quick ride to the cemetery. And so we started doing that. And I would sit in the car and watch this guy and he would go and he would kneel down. He'd brush off the grave, the snow off the grave. And, and then as we got closer, he invited me to do this with him. So we had this ritual. We'd go, we'd clean off her grave. He'd rearrange the plastic flowers there. And, and he would tell me one day, you know, we're going to build a cross here and all this stuff that he was going to do. And, and so um, I watched this guy do this every day. And I'm going to tell you, I, Think about the love that that man had for a woman to go every single day to visit her at the graveyard, to ride his bike. And I thought, man, this is a lesson. You know, God's teaching me love, you know, to have that kind of a love for someone um, was so amazing. And, and I really do believe that you know, he was sent to me to give me that lesson. And unfortunately, when I got hurt, I was going in for surgery and this priest came to bless me. And he was from that parish and he looked down at me on this gurney when they were wheeling me in. He said, you're the quarterback at Notre Dame. And I said, yeah, he goes, you're Harry Davis's friend. I said, that's right. He goes, does Harry know you play football? And I said, no, I never told him that. You know, I said, we're just friends. Right. And he said, oh, my goodness. And he gave me a blessing. Right. So after about, you know, two to three weeks when I was stable enough to get back to mass, I went over to see Harry and he, he, he didn't recognize me at all. He, he was, they were trying to, he had the only home on this highway. And so all these businesses were around him and he thought I was, he said, I know who you are. You're here from, you know, trying to, trying to buy my house. I said, no, I said, I'm your friend, Frank, you know, and I, and I gave him a sweater, you know, but I bought him a, a white wool sweater. I never forget that. But I often think back of him and the incredible lessons that I got from watching this man kneel in the snow, you know, so committed and so loving his wife and missing her. You know, as we all deal with getting older, my dad passed two years ago. It was a horrible thing. Right. But when you really get to it, you're, you're blessed that, it's when you mourn, you, you feel so happy that I could love something that much, you know, to care about something so much. And I think as leaders, I mean, I think that's what we have to aspire to. You know, could we earn that? And I mean, that's a key word. Do you earn that love? Do you earn that respect uh, from others? And if you did, you lived you lived a great life. I got just two more questions for you and then one last statement. And I appreciate uh, all your time. But, you know, we played Notre Dame. Um, when Mike and I were at USF and I remember heading out of the locker room at Notre Dame and it had play like a champion on there. And obviously you've seen movies and, and we've hit that sign, but what does that mean to you of someone that played at Notre Dame? And when you were going out of the locker room, yeah. What did you feel? What, why was that such a big deal? I'll tell you, it, it was, I can't even describe how electric it was, you know, to go in through and hit the sign and go through that tunnel, you know, with, with your teammates. And when you went out in that field and you heard that roar of the crowd and the fight song played, it was really amazing. But again, you get back to, you know, and I think this has been lost, you know, and unfortunately it's been lost in, in translation where people today, you know, it's really about if my players are better than your players, we win. Or if I shoot better than you shoot that day, you win. Where to me, you know, what wins is that culture and that tradition, that history, 
you know, uh, we're blessed, you know, USF has a great history, you know, and I think those are things that kids got to understand today that you're playing for something bigger than you. You know, you put that Notre Dame helmet on, you know, you're doing what, what Rockney did, what Leahy did and all these different guys, you know, and, and I have to admit, I went through a period, Jeff, my freshman year, where I thought maybe I need to leave, you know, Clements was the number one on the number two in freshman year. And I got hurt, you know, because I didn't play my senior year, I started out as number nine. So it was really hard to overtake. Maybe if Tom and I had gotten there together, maybe, you know, but he had the edge because he came in as one, I came in as nine, you know, and, uh, and so I had to battle my way up and, and got to two. And and I remember we were playing Michigan freshman game and, you know, my dad was there and I didn't play a lot and I was really disappointed. And I remember thinking, maybe this isn't the place for me. And I was walking to the locker room and it was still hadn't been renovated yet. It was still the old locker room that Rockney used. And I'm going through these old metal lockers and I see this little plaque and it says, I've got to go rock, but I'm not afraid. But one time when the, when the boys are down, the brakes are beating them, you know, I ask them to go out there and win just one for the Gipper. I don't know where I'll be rock, but wherever I am, I'll know and I'll be happy. And I looked at that sign. And I said, this is where I need to be. You know, this is where I need to be. So when you talk about that tradition and that whole core of, of what, you know, you are, I know how you feel about USF. Well, I feel that way about USF as an administrator, and I feel the way about Notre Dame as my alma mater. It's a special place. I was really blessed to have been there and learned countless lessons from it and, and still learned. I had a recruit yesterday on campus, a, you know, a, a volleyball player, or a, a, excuse me, it was a golfer. And I was telling her, I said, you know, the thing about USF and you see these signs on the streets change the world from here. I go, they actually mean that. It's not just a slogan that somebody came up with. The people believe that from Father Paul to Charlie Cross to Larry Williams, R.A.D. They really believe it. And I want to be around people like that. And I'm blessed to be a part of that tradition, as were you. So beautiful. I'm just going to jump to the end. We always end each episode with a quote from John Alston that states, the only thing you take with you when you're gone is what you leave behind. Obviously you've impacted so many people coach and uh, you've been blessed to have beautiful family and grandkids. And we'll fast forward 30 years for you. You're on your deathbed. You're getting ready to take your last breath. What is it you want the people that have been in your life to, to when you leave for them to know deep down in their heart and soul that, that you've left behind with them? Well, I, I think I think it would be to, to to lead a life, to live that this that my life isn't ending with this. You know, it changes. Right. It just the spirit is there. Right. And I would just hope that my spirit would live in them. You know, that's a lesson I try to give to my grandkids all the time. Right. We, we just talk about living the right way and having that that real spirit. You know, it's sad. I mean, with my dad, you know, I, there's certain things I have my father's pen and pencil set, you know, here that I just love it because it was in his hand. You know, those are things that I have to remind me of him. And and I and I and I just think that, you know, I remember telling a CYO kid that I coached, Ken Tui. One day he said, Why do you do this, coach? You drive us all around in your station wagon. I mean, our CYO kids would play 60 games a year. I'd drive them all over the state to play. And I said, You want to know why, Ken? I said, One day I'm going to be dead and gone, and you're going to be at your kitchen table. And I said, And your kid's going to say, Hey, Dad. I got this new CYO coach. He's the greatest coach. And maybe you'll say, no, mine was. And I said, I don't know where I am, but wherever I am, maybe my star will twinkle a little bit brighter that day because I was remembered by you. Pashito, get us out of here, baby. Wow. The whole time I'm sitting here, Pasha, I'm thinking, man, why couldn't coach have been my high school coach? <laughs> my high school coach would talk about his uh, – one year playing on the UCLA JV team and how great he was. But he didn't teach us all these life lessons. Like, I just learned this short hour with you, Coach. I appreciate that. I'm jealous for everyone that you've coached and everyone that you're a part of their lives right now. And I feel like now I'm a part of – you're a part of my life now. I'm going to take those lessons. And, yeah, you've made us be a little bit better today. I appreciate it. Thank you and keep doing this great stuff. Thanks again, Coach. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, both of you, really. And to keep up doing the work that you do, because as I said earlier, you know, there's a destiny that makes us brothers. No one walks their path alone. We're all in this together, 
and we 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 know we are challenged more than ever because we're in a in a time in the world and in America that we need this. You know, this is what we need. You know, I've often said that we all know what works. We're just not willing to do it anymore, and we just have to keep fighting the good fight. You know, uh, one of my former players sent me a podcast the other day. He said, "Keep fighting the good fight. You do it every day." That was our mantra with our team. Whenever we left each other, we always said, fight the good fight. There's only a few of us left, right? And we've got to keep fighting that and keep trying to change lives and inspire people to live the way we are so we can once again be great again. I love it. Again, we've been on with Coach Frank Alaco, uh, Season 3, Episode 7. You can find him at his website, frankalaco.com, and it's A-L-L-O-C-C-O.com. Listeners, thanks. This has been in one incredible episode, just probably my favorite and greatest treat uh, for me, Coach. Thank you so much. And this is how we do it. Boom, baby. That just happened. We out.